an evaluation consultant at a, an evaluation firm called First Person Consulting. Uh, and today I'm going to be taking you through a bit of a practical exploration of some of the benefits of failure. So I've got a little bit of an introductory spiel uh, and a little bit of a practical exercise uh, a bit later on as well. Um, uh, what we're going to be doing today is really centering in on this idea that failure is a good thing. Um, before I do any of that though, uh, and already I have started off on the wrong foot, uh, first I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land upon which we are all joining from today. Um, by all means, I would encourage you to uh, uh, leave in the chat where you're joining us from. Um, I would like to pay my respects to elders past and present uh, and to welcome you all uh, here today as well. Um, as I said, we're talking about the, uh, the benefits of failure today. Uh, as a part of this uh, learning sprint that we're delivering this week. Um, so there was a session on yesterday, which I know some of you attended, um, and then there's another session on tomorrow, uh, addressing sort of some of the conversations that uh, were started yesterday around power. Uh, and then there's a final session on Thursday, uh, led by the excellent Nick and Cam, who are both here today, keeping an eye on me, I'm sure. Um, so again, thank you all for coming. Hope to see you at some of the other events later during the week. Um, for today though, I'm in control and we're going to go through things in my usual uh, chaotic and uh, furious fashion. Um, I've got you for another 56 minutes. Um, so I'm just going to dive right into my, my introductory spiel. But like I said, you will have to actually engage in an activity a little bit later on uh, as well. So just be prepared um, because you will be required to do stuff. Otherwise, this whole experiment will fail. Uh, but at the least, I'll have learned something. Um, so yesterday, for those of you that were there, um, this will be a bit of a repeat, but just to, uh, to uh, I guess, contextualize what I'm talking about a little bit for people that weren't. Um, yesterday, I was addressing this uh, sort of point around the fear of failure that we sometimes have in evaluation. Um, uh, and I mean, that's for, for good reasons, but in the context of innovation and design processes, there's usually this idea that there's a, a willingness to fail um, because it helps you sort of propel your thinking or your ideas or your interventions forward. Um, I mean, obviously failure by itself is not a good thing. Uh, it can cause um, uh, damage, you know, team morale, cause harm to, to people that you're trying to work with or serve, it can waste money. So it's not inherently a good thing. Um, the key thing really is that you want to do it well, um, or what I uh, called yesterday, failing with a plan, intelligent failure, um, essentially where you're trying to sort of fail with intent uh, so that you can progress forward. Um, my sort of provocation yesterday was that evaluation is not really good with what I've called internal failure. So it's a risk to be mitigated, um, usually because it means disappointing people. Um, I think we are particularly good at supporting others um, to sort of uh, go through their own intelligent failure process. Um, but my sort of argument yesterday was that sometimes looking in the mirror can be a bit intimidating, um, but also that idea of sharing failure or, or our experiences with failure and what we've learned from it um, is far less common. Um, there is this book by uh, um, Kylie Hutchinson, which does talk about evaluation failures, which is quite interesting, um, just as a, as a side note to that. Um, so yesterday I was kind of arguing that one of the reasons I think we don't share um, far and wide what we've experienced or what we've learned from our failures is that, um, you know, this fear of judgment uh, by our peers. Um, for me, for instance, I think of this in terms of consulting and the idea that maybe potential clients will hear about some of the blunders that I've made in my practice and, uh, you know, judge me for, for my um, mistakes um, because of what I've shared. Hopefully that is not the case, um, but that's, you know, one assumption that I kind of made. Um, and so I think we really need to support the idea that, you know, to share is to be vulnerable. We need to kind of support that um, and that, you know, sharing your experiences uh, of mistakes that you've made or, or failures that have occurred isn't inherently um, as an indicator that you're a bad evaluator or a bad consultant or a bad, um, a bad uh, person or anything like that. So what we really need is, you know, a kind of architecture or space that facilitates this sharing. Um, the conference is a great example um, uh, of that sort of process. Um, obviously we didn't necessarily get a conference, um, but there have been other opportunities for that. Um, my sort of tagline yesterday was the idea that yes, there are risks that we need to manage, but really we should be trying to embrace these mistakes or these failures that occur. Um, uh, these is, this is now new content for those that were there yesterday. Um, partially the reason for that is because it allows the sector to reflect on itself. Uh, and I think like good evaluators, it also means that we can kind of question why things have happened in the way that they have. Could things be done differently? Um, why are things being done the way they are? 
um, we strengthen our own practice by reflecting on those failures and trying to identify um, what the learning was. Uh, we can avoid repeating failures that should have been avoided. Um, we can seek support from others. You know, I made this mistake. I feel terrible about it. You know, let me share my experiences and what I learned from it. And I think that's particularly important if you're not part of a team or you're part of a small team. Um, but then also I think there's this inherent benefit for others new to evaluation um, where they hear these experiences from, you know, potentially quite experienced evaluators. Um, and it can be, I think for me, a, a bit of a reassurance that, you know, everyone makes mistakes. Um, but then also by sharing that learning, you're helping to circling back to the first point, uh, sorry, circling back to the, yeah, the first point and second point, we're strengthening our own practice uh, and capabilities as well through that process. Uh, so the purpose of today really is to turn a bit of a mirror, not onto me, but onto yourselves. Um, and so the process that we're gonna go through after I um, finish this little introductory spiel um, builds off a process that I ran at the 2018 evaluation conference. Um, so from that experience, I got some good feedback. And so I've kind of changed it up a little bit, uh, but then obviously had to adapt it for this virtual um, process, which hopefully kind of works uh, as intended, but we'll see. Um, so some of the rules of engagement that uh, I'd like you to think about or keep in mind um, is that, you know, I'm going to be asking uh, people through this process to kind of share some of their experiences. And so, you know, suspending judgment is really important. Um, we're here to share and learn. Um, and those that do share their experiences, you know, congratulations is, and, um, and support is warranted for, for being vulnerable in that space. Um, the other part of it that I have noticed myself sometimes is that there can be this desire to kind of provide advice or solve, as I called it here. Um, really, we're not worried about, you know, oh, next time you could think about this. Um, we're really just here to learn from others and what they have learned from that experience um, rather than, you know, providing advice unless someone, you know, flags um, uh, a piece of advice that, or, or would like to, to provide some advice. Um, and also importantly, you know, participate in a way that makes you most comfortable as well. So I will ask you to engage, but if you don't feel like it or you don't feel, um, or you don't feel like you have much to add, but you just want to listen, that's also totally fine. So really what our goal here is today is to apply this kind of framework or this process um, as a way of reflecting on our mistakes, our failures, our learning, um, uh, but then also to think about, you know, a way forward uh, for this sort of process. And I guess this kind of idea um, that I've suggested around how we can kind of foster a bit of a stronger culture for learning for evaluators, um, which is distinct from, you know, the sort of culture of learning that maybe comes externally. I'm trying to sort of turn it a, a bit more inwards uh, as well. Um, but before I ask you to do anything, I thought it would be important to, uh, you know, lead from the front as it were. Uh, so here's a couple of examples of mistakes that I've made. Uh, one of my first ever projects that I uh, worked on in evaluation involved one day of data entry of some feedback forms and stuff. Um, it took me a grand total of six days to do it because I didn't want to admit that I didn't know what the different export formats for the data from SurveyMonkey meant. And so I downloaded basically an expanded version, which meant that the column headers ran for about, you know, 100 columns, um, which meant that as I was going through and entering data in various spots, it took a long time to scroll across and get through all of them. And so it ended up taking me six days because essentially I just didn't want to admit that I had no idea what I was doing um, when it came to just getting some data out of SurveyMonkey. Very simple issue or error. I could have just asked someone, but at the time I didn't want to do it because I was in a new job. I didn't want to sort of... Um, sort of, uh, I guess, admit that something so foundational was not something I'd done before. Um, uh, this is probably one of my favorite ones. Uh, and I know others have maybe done this, uh, this sort of thing before where you've sent the wrong document to someone. Um, in this particular example, I did not know that I'd sent the wrong document. And it was actually not just a draft version of the report. It was actually just blatantly incomplete with notes to myself throughout and, and things like that. Um, the client then spent about a couple of days reviewing it uh, and then called me and they were like, I'm not really happy with the quality of this uh, draft report. You know, there's like some sections that need some more work. Um, so I was, you know, very confused because I thought it was quite good. Uh, I was quite happy with it. I went and opened the, the document that was attached to the email uh, and quite clearly the draft was wrong because uh, there were sections in it that just said, I need to think about this more. I'll come back later. Um, so, you know, it was very much an incomplete version. Um, they sort of didn't question it. They just assumed that they'd been sent the correct version. I didn't actually check what I had attached. 
uh, they wasted their time. They were also not happy and uh, particularly impressed. Uh, and then I just looked a bit, um, a bit dumb, to be honest, because I'd sent them the wrong thing. Again, very rectifiable and everything. And we had a laugh about it later on. But at the time, I was mortified by what I had done uh, as well um, in that particular instance. Um, so now I actually, uh, I don't know if others do this. Um, maybe it's a bit over the top, but I actually have an email delay or email send delay. And so I hit send and then I actually recall the email immediately and then double check what I've attached because I'm so paranoid that I'm going to do it again. Uh, and the person will not be as understanding as that um, person was who wasted their two days of time reviewing this terrible, terrible document. Um, then there's the, the classic ones, uh, the many times that I have not taken the client on the journey of evaluation, still working out how I'm going to uh, do that. Um, uh, the one time I took the wrong USB stick to a workshop, uh, a day long workshop. And so I had to just present and facilitate from memory. Um, the workshop went terribly. Everyone was unhappy. It did not do what it was meant to do. Um, I did get the right USB stick after the lunch break, but by the, by the end of the morning, people were like, this is just a schmozzle. Um, so there's just a few examples. Uh, and if you want more detail, I can give it to you. Um, but just to give you a sense of, I guess, you know, the different levels that these um, failures can occur at. Um, so start to think about your own experience um, or examples uh, from your own practice um, while we go through this next little bit. As some more just lighthearted examples, um, th these were from Twitter, um, which you can just read to yourself. Uh, it was like a Twitter thread around people basically making professional mistakes or mistakes in their professional practice. Um, you know, again, lots of learning that they probably got from that experience. Um, but uh, I guess highlighting that everyone does make a mistake or, or does make those failures at times. Um, this particular uh, summary that I came across um, a few years ago now, I quite liked because it kind of breaks down the idea of making mistakes or, or um, failing at something in a few different ways. Um, so the, the Y axis there, which is kind of focused on like your opportunity for learning. Um, and the X axis there is sort of how intentional was that mistake or was that failure? So the sort of bottom left quadrant there, what they've called sloppy mistakes um, is, is essentially, you know, the mistakes that are just caused by you not really paying attention or, or whatever else, kind of the mistakes you'd want to be avoiding, like attaching the wrong, the wrong document to an email and sending it off. Um, the, the other three versions of mistakes there kind of reflect um, different levels of learning that you get out of making a mistake, um, but also how intentional that mistake is. So the bottom right, uh, high stakes mistakes, which is kind of fun to say three times fast, um, really is about the idea that you know, you, you make a mistake by sort of putting yourself in a situation where there's high stakes, like for instance, uh, the scores are tied at the end of a, a, of a football match, you know, all you need is one point and then you just kick it and it goes off to the side and, you know, to draw or you lose or whatever it is. But, you know, there's situations um, where, you know, everything's on the line, you've done all of the work that you can, mistake happens, you learn from it, but there's not much else that you can do. Um, the stretch mistakes one is, is kind of, you know, putting yourself out there uh, as a way of um, learning. And so that's, you know, you're sort of pushing yourself beyond your uh, capability or boundary that you know that you can deliver on. Um, so there's a lot of learning opportunities there and you're kind of doing it intentionally. Um, the last one, the aha moment mistakes is basically where you're not setting out to make a mistake uh, necessarily, but you learn heaps from it because of some sort of opportunity or something that's, that's um, resulted from it. This is another uh, sort of neat little summary. Um, the, the kind of idea here is essentially, um, this is from like a um, innovation -y type person, but they were talking about, you know, the difference between um, making mistakes, having practices, but then like the area that you really want to focus is on this idea of experimenting. Um, and that's, you know, going back to the, the previous slide, um, the sort of intentionality piece um, where you're kind of directly setting out to learn something and that you accept that you may or may not fail. Um, but the key thing for them is that, you know, you're learning from that experience. Um, so in summary, uh, hopefully that's given you something to think about, but really what we're talking about there is that not all failures are created equal. Um, they're also not always desirable. Um, the learning process from those failures is not automatic. So we need to reflect um, and try to sort of derive or uh, identify um, the learning. Um, and 
yes, and the last one. Um, and that failure can be beneficial. Um, it can be a good thing. And so we can communicate uh, that learning, that experience to others and ultimately do better next time. Okay, so now we're gonna get a bit more practical. Uh, uh, not physical, practical. Um, what we're gonna do through this process here is talk about our own experiences with, um, with failure, but we're gonna sort of unpack it through three different lenses. Um, the first one being the failure itself. Um, the second one being the context within which that failure occurred. Uh, and then thirdly, you know, what have we learned from that experience? Um, so that the sort of failure component really is about the time where you made a mistake, uh, an error, you failed in some form. Um, I try to think about it or encourage you to think about it in terms of an internal occurrence rather than external one. So as in like something that you did or, or um, uh, sort of contributed to in some form rather than, you know, someone else didn't do something and therefore I failed because of that. Um, the context, so the context or environment within which that experience uh, occurred. Uh, and then finally, the learning component. So given all of the above, um, you know, thinking about what went well, what didn't, um, what would you do or what might you do or what could you do uh, if the situation and context were to repeat? Um, are there specific lessons, generalizable lessons um, that, that kind of emerge for you? Uh, so for me, for instance, one of the key lessons was always double check what's attached to the email. And that's something I've never stopped doing since that experience. Um, if I think there should be an easier way to do something when it comes to things like survey platforms, there probably is, doesn't actually hurt to either ask people, but also um, you can just Google your question and typically the answer is going to be there. Um, but I guess like the key sort of generalizable lesson for them from that experience for me was the idea that if it seems like there should be an easy way to do it, there probably is. Um, so that's again, just to give you a bit of a sense of what I'm talking about here. Um, so we're gonna go through this process on uh, a Miro board. Um, but if you don't want to, you can kind of replicate the same sorts of steps um, just on a, on a piece of paper. Or if you don't want to sort of do it publicly and you'd rather keep it to yourself, um, by all means, just do it on a bit of paper in front of you um, uh, or on your desk or, or whatever it might be. Or if you just want to sort of think but don't actually want to write down, also fine as well. Um, so what I'm going to do quickly, uh, stop sharing for a moment. Um, so in the chat uh, momentarily, uh, I'm going to paste a uh, Miro board link, which uh, you should be able to see now uh, once I stop accidentally sending it to Michelle directly. Um, so if you click on that link, um, it will bring you into the Miro board. So if you haven't used a Miro board before, um, it's effectively just like a, a big virtual whiteboard. Um, so I'm just going to bring everyone to me. So I have magical powers that uh, everyone else doesn't have. So hopefully you can see the sort of waiting room uh, little space that I've uh, that I've created. Uh, I'm just going to give give it another minute or two um, so that people can join. Okay. Um, so the main things, just in terms of orienting yourself. Uh, and what you'll need to do for this process. Really, all you're gonna need to do is to zoom in and zoom out, which you can do with your um, with your mouse wheel. You might need to hold down control to do that. You can also use the controls in the bottom right corner. Um, besides that, all you're gonna need to do is basically move some sticky notes around and write on them. That's effectively all there is to it. Okay, so what we're gonna do first, just to uh, coming into area number two, just to get used to using a mirror board, um, you'll see up the top, there's a whole bunch of sticky notes there. Um, what I'd like you to do first is a bit of an exercise just to get used to the idea of moving sticky notes around uh, is to grab a sticky note and place it into either the sweet or savory category, uh, depending on what your preference is between the two. And you have to pick one, you can't fence it. Um, but then to also add in there, what is one of your favorite foods that fit within that category? So for me, for instance, um, mine is probably, uh, yeah, definitely savory. Um, and I just really love chips. Like, I don't know what it is, but chips are just great. And I just love them so much. Someone else does too, actually, I can see there. Um, yep, great. Someone's gone even one step further and said hot chips rather than chips. I should have clarified. Yes, hot chips, 
crisps, depending on where you're from. Uh, also good, but I would probably put pot chips above that. Okay. Good, good, good. Okay, so now we're going to move down. Okay, great. Um, to the next spot. So, so exert my magic controls. Okay, so hopefully now you can all see what is quite a large and uh, intimidating space. I'm just gonna share my screen for the benefits of those who aren't here, um, but maybe join later. Um, so now you can see what is probably quite an intimidating uh, view, um, which is essentially three uh, frames, um, each labeled failure context and learning. Um, so these are the sorts of uh, procedural steps that we're gonna go through. Um, I've also placed off to the left-hand side, you can see there the, uh, the screenshot of the sort of four different types of mistakes uh, or failures that um, I briefly touched on before. Um, so what we're gonna do here uh, is I'm gonna give everyone uh, a couple of minutes. Hopefully you've been thinking about your individual experiences today. Um, what we're gonna do is we're gonna start with this failure frame. Um, and so what I'd like you to do is to grab a sticky note. You can see them there up the top. Uh, you're now experts at this process of grabbing sticky notes and writing in them. Um, and just reflect for a couple of minutes um, on what one of your experiences was in terms of making a mistake or, or, or a failure. Um, but try and categorize it based on these four different options that are above the top, uh, up the top here. So you can see, for instance, uh, I've called it careless rather than sloppy, um, but a careless mistake being those that are, you know, attaching the wrong document to an email. Um, the aha mistakes, which are those that are, you know, a very positive experience, but they're also quite hard to plan for. So that intentionality piece, um, uh, which is, you know, basically where we achieve something or, or um, you know, get to a place that wasn't what we intended um, and, you know, we didn't know that we could get there, but, you know, it's kind of a eureka moment that you managed to pull off that thing that you did. So it's kind of a, a weird version of making a mistake or, or failing because in that context, it might end up being a better outcome, but it's not an intended one. And so that's why it's categorized as a mistake or a failure in this context. Um, the high stakes ones where, you know, everything's uh, on the line, you've done all that you can, um, really all you can do at the end of the day is either celebrate or mourn the outcome. Um, and then the stretch mistakes are those ones where, you know, something might be really challenging. Um, you can't get help from anyone. So you're putting yourself out there. You're really pushing yourself. Um, it's really about being challenged in a way that's quite new to you as well. So uh, with that in mind, and I can see Nick and Cam who are clearly mirror board users as well because their names are attached. Um, if you can grab a sticky note and place it in that area and jot down your uh, sort of experience and what we're really focusing on here and you can see the tip or some of the tips across uh, on the left hand side there um, you know we're being quite introspective here um, we're not sort of uh, ascribing responsibility to others so you know I failed because my you know boss didn't do x or whatever it might be um, uh, yeah like we're really just trying to talk about ourselves here in this context so not sort of putting it onto someone else um, and then the, the thing that we'll really be focusing on after we finish on this stage is the, the role of context in why that situation occurred. Um, sorry, Michelle, I did it again. Someone just wanted the link. Um, if, um, if Miro doesn't load for you, uh, you can just try re, um, uh, refreshing it um, or, or clicking on the link again. But like I said, if it's not loading for you, by all means, you can kind of follow the same sort of process just by jotting it down on a bit of paper. So really it's just about what's that experience with, um, with a, a failure or, or a mistake. Um, don't worry about the other two steps at this particular stage. Um, so we can see here quite a few careless mistakes, which is interesting. Um, things like not backing up documents correctly, sending emails to the wrong people, um, uh, typo in an email, pubic health intern rather than public health intern. Wrong version of document, I can totally, uh, totally empathize there. Um, no explicitly addressing an aspect of the project brief, missing a work flight, sounds awful. Um, sending emails to the wrong person with the same name. Um, send colleague to the wrong venue. <laughs> 
um, not thoroughly checking uh, work before submitting. Yep, can totally uh, understand those experiences. Um, some of the aha ones, um, which is quite interesting. Spending too much uh, time planning when the situation changes a lot and rapidly. Um, learned about good reporting after submitting the report. Um, holding a focus group at the wrong time, which accidentally created opportunities for multiple people to engage in smaller group exercises exercises and produce many more insights. Yep, so, you know, a mistake, didn't do it at the right time, but something good still resulted from it. Um, so that's that's a great example. Um, overcooking a piece of work that wasn't needed. Yep, definitely have, have done that. Um, some of the high stakes ones. Um, uh, yep, yeah, that's quite an interesting one. Uh, from the minister interviewing a high level government minister and asking the wrong questions and not recording the answers. Um, some of the stretch ones. Um, a constellation exercise with a group of people who didn't want to move, setting up a consulting firm, did very much so. Uh, first encounter with Google Analytics. Um, submitting a great proposal for a high impact project and coming in second. Yeah, that's really good. Great. Really, really good examples there. Um, great. That's perfect. Um, does anyone, and again, I'm asking a lot potentially, but does anyone want to uh, unmute themselves and explicitly comment on one of their experiences there um, to provide a little more color, I guess, rather than me just reading it out? Um, I'm not gonna force people to do it though, so you don't have to. Um, so I'm not gonna do that thing where the people that have their cameras on are kind of make eye contact with you unknowingly and then say, hey, Nick, do you wanna unmute yourself and talk about your example? Uh, I'm not gonna do that. Um, yeah, but if anyone does want to unmute themselves uh, and just briefly comment on what their example was, um, by all means. Well, you said me, Matt, so I'll, I'll talk so <laughs> we don't have to wait forever. I, I was thinking about the one, the constellation exercise that was me where people didn't want to move. And I, I came in really mm -hmm. enthusiastically with a group of people trying to get them to kind of physicalize their relationships to one another. Um, but mm -hmm. I didn't really read the room properly. And I think that they were... Um, uh, well, they didn't like each other, I think was a simple way of describing it. And they, so they didn't want to move. They didn't want to be closer or further away. And they just wanted to kind of sit there. Um, so it went very flat, very quickly. Um, just the worst. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Thanks, Nick. Um, Alinda, I can see you've unmuted yourself. Yeah, I'll just, I'll just jump in quickly. I put mine in yeah. both high stakes and careless. Um, and I guess it's one of those technology things, and it, but it's maybe it's illustrative because it's from very early in Microsoft Word. Um, there was an error where if you didn't hit save before you went file send, you were going to send the previous version of your document. So um, mm. in this example, you know, a branch in my government department had, had given me a list of people that had been consulted. Um, mm. And then they kind of rang back and said, oh, but drop that this group off. They weren't consulted but hmm. I didn't hit save and the, you know, the answer went to the minister's office and the minister actually misled parliament um, by oh. saying that these people had been consulted. And it's one of those weird, well, I don't know if it's careless because it's that not knowing the, the um, traps, I guess, the booby traps hmm. of you, and everybody yeah. knows word now and you can possibly do that now, but it kind of makes me reflect on the, the newer tech because I think we've been through another massive step um, and there's a lot of sort of Google Analytics type mistakes that people have put. So it's it's just that um, whatever generation of tech you're with is is really trying to accelerate your learning curve and and not tempt fate, I guess. Um, you know, um, I hope there are versions of this in Google Analytics, but you really have to save, close, go into your email, attach, and then you knew you had the right version, maybe. So. Yeah. It's, I mean, in a way, it's, it's a decades old one, but in another way, it's, I think the learning is probably, yeah, is what keeps happening to us and, and what we should give ourselves fail safes on. Yeah, yeah, great. And I mean, it's quite interesting, like you made the point about like technology there. And I think about my own experiences, I mentioned the one before about basically exporting the wrong mm -hmm. uh, structure of the survey data out of SurveyMonkey to then add these hard copy responses onto. Um, but you think like, you know, that was a fairly straightforward experience, but now like 
like I'm sitting here using mirror boards and, and things like that. Like there's just newer and newer and more complex yeah. platforms and, and things like that that can be used and ultimately that you could potentially screw up <laughs> to, to be blatantly honest. Um, for instance, mm. the first time I actually used Miro with a client, they I didn't lock it and then they accidentally selected everything and deleted it, um, which has probably happened to some other people as well. But yeah, like those sorts of you know experiences. Um, okay, great, thank you. Um, so what we're gonna do now, uh, so thinking about that experience, so keeping that at the forefront of your mind, um, the next thing I want you to do is to move down to the, the context board. So that's the next one down. Um, so I can make everyone do that. Um, so same premise as what we just did, the sticky notes just up above. Um, but what I'd like you to think about now with that experience um, was what was the, the prompt questions are off to the left here. What was that context or situation that sort of, um, that was surrounding that experience? Um, you know, thinking about things like what did you have control or not over um, that influenced what happened? Um, so for instance, uh, as an example, again, version of the document that I sent that was wrong to um, uh, my client at the time. One of the reasons why I sent the wrong version uh, was because I was multitasking because I was under pressure to finish a proposal that was also due that day. Um, and so I was switching between tasks, you know, quite quickly. And, you know, I just want to send this thing off because, you know, once it was off my desk, uh, it was onto theirs. And then, you know, that would give me a couple of days of free time to then focus on this other task. And so I was switching between things and not really keeping an eye on what I was doing. Um, so, you know, contextually, I was basically multitasking because I was time poor. Um, and, you know, the, the extent to which I had control over that situation and that pressure, you know, maybe not so much, but it definitely had an influence over what actually happened. And then, you know, those flow on consequences from that as well. Um, the, the context or, or the situation that I was in with um, my survey monkey debacle, uh, that was very much a, a result of essentially not feeling um, like I could ask what I considered to be stupid questions. Um, so that was, you know, sort of day one in a new role basically. And I didn't want to come across like I was um, inept or, or not capable at using um, the platform, particularly because I considered myself uh, or and would consider myself pretty tech savvy. Um, and that, that was something that I kind of pitched to them during the interview process, like, oh, I can use technology. I'm, I'm pretty across it. And so I didn't want to sort of, you know, basically undercut myself or feel like I was undercutting myself um, by saying like, oh, is there a better way to do this? Um, so, you know, again, just a couple of examples just to um, get you thinking there about, you know, sometimes these mistakes or these failures occur, um, not because of anything you have control over necessarily, but I think it's important to sort of reflect on those contextual factors that can influence why a situation occurs so that you can then start to think about um, when we get to the next stage, you know, what, what can we take away from this experience that's, um, you know, going to help us next time. Um, so again, we'll just give you a, a couple of minutes just to think about that sort of experience. Um, if you want to keep adding more examples to the, uh, to the examples of uh, mistakes or failures up top, by all means, um, but otherwise, uh, if you can sort of focus on the context question for this next one, that would be, that would be good. Um, and similar to before, if someone wants to kind of brief us on what the context was for the situation, um, uh, you, can, you can do that as well. Um, so I can see here that people have already started adding some things. So time poor, being interrupted halfway through a task, time pressure. I get the feeling that time, time pressure is gonna be quite a common uh, contextual factor for a lot of these, um, uh, I don't wanna say careless, it sounds too negative, but the, you know, uh, those so sorts of mistakes. Um, uh, yep, trying to squeeze in two trips in quick succession, probably jet lagged. Um, a new project, a new client and new to the work, unfamiliar with what was really needed. Yep, that's a, a really great example. Um, uh, yeah, and people leaving, new people coming on, assumptions about who knows what, uh, another great example. Um, oop, got some over here. Time pressures, time pressure. Um, no experts in the organization to ask for assistance. Uh, no budget to engage an external developer. Yeah, so all great examples of, of those different sorts of contextual factors. Um, does anyone want to, uh, same premises with Alinda and Nick, does anyone want to sort of unmute themselves and just briefly touch on 
um, I guess what their what their example was if they're willing to share it, but otherwise, um, uh, um, otherwise just to touch on you know what what your experience was being in that context or in that environment. That's okay. I'm not going to force anyone. I'm Ash. Yes. Hello. Hey, it's Kara here. I'm sorry. Oh, hi, I'm, no, okay. <laughs> I'm I'm in New Zealand, so I'm right in the middle of cooking my family's dinner. So um, I'm multitasking massively. <laughs> but I um, and I so I'm not able to go into the merry board. But one of the things that um, I've been reflecting on, particularly in the context area, is um, thinking about a couple of some of my more challenging projects and um, where distance really does become a barrier. Um, one of the projects that involved quite a bit of co-design and, um, and so the fact that there was physical distance between a lot of the team members, I think actually really took away from the ability for the project overall and my evaluation component from doing a really good job because we actually, I think we could have benefited a lot from proximity, more FaceTime. Um, and so I have other projects where we have a really good rapport, everything's going well. And so distance is just a really efficient way for us to do what we need to do. But some of the other projects, if I think about them, um, it, whenever you run into challenges, often the best way to resolve those is face-to-face -face, and sometimes that's actually impossible to do. Um, so that's just actually a reflection on the reflection. <laughs> Great, thanks, Carol. Ariel here, I have one too. So my problem was that quite a few months into strategy role, I realized how strongly my view of the organization was really filtered through one perspective. And so I was you know, planning change while not fully understanding the status quo and planning impact evaluation, all of that. And I mean, this was exacerbated by the job starting and then going into long lockdown. But I think for me, the biggest thing was that I kept prioritizing the doing over the planning and the networking. And that, you know, although I'd say, why should somebody else's emergency, urgent, urgency become my emergency? I wasn't really standing my ground on that because it was all so important that things needed to be done. Yeah, like when everything's equally important, it's a bit hard, or at least framed as equally important. Um, absolutely. Thanks for that, Ari. Um, if there's anyone else, by all means, just unmute yourself and jump in. Um, but otherwise, I'll get you to go on to the next bit uh, in a second. Okay. Um, so what we'll do now um, is moving to the last, uh, last little component. Um, so this is our sort of learning piece. And so you've kind of uh, started to hear from um, some people about, uh, you know, some of the sort of experiences or takeaways that uh, are kind of emerging. Um, so this final stage, the learning sort of component is really about trying to say, well, okay, given, given all of the above, so given the, um, the actual experience itself, given that context that I was operating in at the time, you know, what's my takeaway uh, message, my takeaway soundbite for um, myself, but then, uh, you know, thinking of it a bit differently, um, what would I take away from this that I could then share with someone else um, who, you know, may be faced with the same situation and the same context or very similar, um, you know, what's my sort of gift to them that I can provide from my own experience of, um, of making those mistakes and making those values, um, you know, I, I, I would urge you to think of it as like a gift to someone. So you're trying to sort of articulate this, um, this lesson or this insight, um, you know, uh, going, going back to my examples from before. So that, you know, the insight for me or the lesson from that survey monkey experience was that there's probably always a better way to do something when it comes to technology or platforms. Um, if it seems like it's taking a long time, there's probably a faster way. Um, that's, you know, one part of it. And then the other part is that, you know, just ask, like, even if you think it's a dumb question, um, just ask someone um, else in the team or in the organization, because, you know, they might've had the same issue at one point and they might know, um, or they might know where you could go. Um, the, the point with the, um, the attaching of the uh, wrong report to, um, to the email 
my sort of takeaway message to people sometimes is, um, you know, when you're working on those sorts of uh, um, type timeframes for, you know, proposals and current projects, uh, as, as one example, um, you know, carve out your time and just focus on whatever it is that you're doing. Don't sort of switch between tasks, um, you know, mid activity. Um, just give yourself that space to, you know, do one thing in time and do it as well as you can. Um, but also, if it seems like you're under a lot of time pressure, you know, raise it early rather than last minute um, as well. And so trying to sort of encourage people, um, you know, they feel like they're under a lot of time pressure. You know, once you start to feel that way, it's probably worth flagging it with, with um, someone around you. So, you know, they might have some time free that they can contribute to helping you, um, helping you write your proposal or whatever it might be. Um, okay, great. So while people are jotting down, I'll just go through some of the ones that are here. Um, building networking time and starting a new role. Ariel, I'm gonna guess that was your one. Um, uh, give something a go to start with, but then come back and do training when there's time to continue to improve. Um, I think that's a really, really good point around, you know, the need to just jump in and start doing something, but also recognizing that, you know, there is a, a benefit to actually sort of taking that time when you do have space to um, to go and, you know, upskill or do that training to learn how to use platforms, products, things like that um, in, a, in a better way. Um, whoever's doing the times two thing, really efficient. And I like your approach to uh, to adding on to, to things like that. Um, checking and rechecking who the audience is and who, the, who is the most influential stakeholder in the organization. Uh, I think that's a great one. Um, and something from my own experience that I would add on to that is that it's even more important in the context of staff turnover. Um, so I have had experiences before where I've had a new uh, client contact person come on board and I've kind of just assumed that their expectations or you know, maybe not even assumed, I just haven't sort of thought about it. Um, but, you know, kind of gone ahead with what was agreed with the previous person. And whilst in the broad scope of what we were delivering, yes, we, we did what we were asked to do. Um, there were some things that if I had just, you know, had that conversation up front with them would have been much more efficient in, in finalizing the project because they just had a way of doing things. And so they wanted to kind of see that reflected in the work that we were um, producing for them. Uh, so very minor thing, but I think, you know, Checking and rechecking, that sort of thing is really important. Um, don't stick to the original plan if that's what's needed. So, I mean, that's uh, kind of aligned to what I was saying there. Um, find trusted sources. Yep, absolutely. Um, uh, that's okay. Whoever added that line, I can just delete that. Um, uh, keep plans manageable. Um, but yes, uh, absolutely. If it seems like the worst mistake ever, things can be managed. Um, don't be a perfectionist, work to a stand that's good enough. Um, doesn't have to clarify five times. Yep, absolutely. Um, de delay email time. So yep, that's something that I uh, instigated um, uh, for my own practice as well. Um, yeah, great. What's going on there? Um, so again, same premise as before, uh, is if anyone wants to kind of uh, mm -hmm. unmute and share their particular lesson, uh, give a gift to the to all the people in the room. Uh, by all means, unmute yourself and, and uh, share your thought, your reflection. Uh, I will not force anyone though, don't, so don't worry. Oh, Matt, it's Cam. Um, I was just going to say that the the fine trusted sources was was mine. Um, and there's something about I think that we all operate. We can find ourselves operating in a world where we might feel a bit isolated, but the value of being able to connect with um, those folks in our circles that will give us honest and open feedback um, as friends and confidants, I think is hugely valuable. People you can run these ideas by so that you don't then find yourself delivering on something, which isn't actually the thing that a, a client in our case was interested in or somebody that you're working in is interested in. So that second or third or fourth pair of eyes um, to look over the work you're doing is just so valuable. I mean, that's a, that's a great sort of insight for people, for instance, who might be considering moving into, for instance, a consulting role and maybe are going to be on their own, uh, at least initially as well. Um, so having those those people that you can rely upon. Um, out of curiosity, and if you're willing to share, what was the uh, what was the the I don't want to call it the failure, but what was the what was the situation that occurred? Oh, it was um, it was a, a project very early on, and. Um, uh, 
it was a relatively small piece of work that I managed to completely overcook um, and came up with this, you know, extraordinary, you know, whiz bang training program, capacity building stuff. Um, Nick was laughing with me the other day. I actually went and bought a printer so that I could print out some of these things. And um, it wasn't what the client needed like, at all. Like it was just like they weren't interested in any of that stuff. So I, I completely went to town on something that didn't need to have it. And had I had somebody to, um, to talk me off the ledge to begin with, they would have said, nah, nah, nah this, isn't, this isn't what anybody wants. <laughs> All right, good stuff. Great, thanks, Cam. Um, uh, last chance for anyone else before I just move on to the last little bit. Can be anyone. Unmute yourself, interrupt me, that's fine. Uh, hi, Matt, this is France. Hi, hi France. Um, I'm struggling to pick a specific mistake because um, I'm lucky to be running my own little consultancy at the moment I kind of fell into it and so I'm doing a lot of learning by doing things mm -hmm. like um, developing a theory of change with a client um, what else um, final report writing and uh, oh, doing participatory work and how participatory is that work and then struggling to maintain my own standards of perfectionism and trying to work to a level that's good enough and knowing um, what's good enough for what situations and when it does have to be perfect, like the final evaluation reporting. Um, so for me, the learning opportunities are just coming thick and fast. It's pretty much a, a, a constant process for me. Um, but what I'm finding really beneficial is having a mentor who I can go to when I'm stuck with something. Um, what would be really great is uh, I think something that Cam was talking about was actually having a variety of people that I could go to to ask about different things so that I'm not tapping that one person on the shoulder all the time. Um, and that actually leads to a question I have, which is how can we do that? How can we set up that network of people around us to ask questions when we have one and to look at things um, which can be quite time consuming. Absolutely. Uh, and you have uh, actually raised the next question that I was going to put to everyone. So this might actually be super beneficial for you. Um, but actually, just to pick up on your point there, I really like the idea of um, the sort of or one of the takeaways being the idea of um, learning when something is good enough as opposed to needing to be perfect. Um, because I think for me, hearing that, the first thing I think of is the time that's required. Um, and, you know, you're going to get 80% of the way there with something like 20% of your effort, but it's that sort of final 20% where you then spend all of your time. And so that sort of um, sort of need to make it perfect is what's going to actually be the thing that takes up a lot of, a lot of your time. Um, what we're going to do now, um, so thank you, everyone, who, uh, who shared in that process. Um, so now the last question I've kind of got um, for everyone um, is exactly uh, to Francis' point around um, around where to next. So we've kind of gone through this process where effectively I've just tried to get you to reflect about your own stuff um, rather than me sharing too much of mine. Um, but I'm interested just in this last couple of minutes before we kind of wrap up, uh, you know, thinking about this experience that we've gone through, you've heard from some people about what their experiences with um, failure were and, and the sort of learning that have taken away from it. Um, you've probably been um, browsing the, the various sticky notes and things like that. Um, so I'm curious just uh, to capture, I guess, some of your thoughts around, um, you know, how might we find a way or, or have a way of um, sharing these sorts of experiences, um, but doing it in a way that's, you know, not just me running these sorts of things, but are there sort of structures or processes or supports that would enable a bit more of an organic and ongoing sharing of um, those experiences? Um, you know, you don't have to have an answer. I guess this is also a broader question um, for, for the sector about, you know, who should actually be sort of instigating or, or leading this sort of process and, uh, and how would it all function and all those sorts of logistical questions. Um, but I guess in terms of what you would find useful in terms of understanding what people's experiences are and what their learning was, you know, what would you like to see uh, exist or um, be in place? Um, so you can um, just spend the next minute or two while I um, uh, stop my screen share and I bring up the other.
document. Um, and then I will uh, do a bit of a close out. Um, or you can just unmute yourself and just think out loud. That's totally fine as well. Um, um, and stuff. Um, okay, well, yes, Cam, that is shameless self-promotion. Um, would you like to outline what your community practice is that you're launching since apparently I'm now just providing a spiel space for you? Um, <laughs> it is, it, I, I didn't mean it to be that, but to, to, the, to the answer, France, your question is, uh, we found ourselves in this, this exact same position and it's like, is there, a, is there a, an environment that we can um, help facilitate and support a, a space where people can come together and share their insights. It's around a particular area of work, so that may not be the exact area that you're interested in, but I do think things like communities of practice are hugely valuable um, as we move through um, our process and our practice and be able to, to connect with others um, in the spaces that we're working with. Um, so I'd encourage anybody to, to, to look for those kinds of communities of practice that make sense in the context of their work. Um, someone uh, has commented there that they basically wrote up a lessons learned slash reflections document and shared it with colleagues. Um, so it sounds like, you know, even just the act of documenting it is beneficial. Um, but then from the sounds of it, you know, extending beyond that, uh, where, like, is there a place where those sorts of things could be housed or retained for the benefit of others who are um, not necessarily uh, colleagues? Um, I mean, these are all sorts of, again, this is just a, a bit of a space to think out loud um, more than anything else. But I guess getting you to start to think about, you know, not just how you learn from those um, experiences that you have, but then what, what are the ways in which you could share those with others, whether it's through a community of practice uh, or something else entirely, documenting it, sharing it with others, you know, putting it out there in some form. Because um, I think that for me is probably the key thing is finding that way or that right. means or that process to share learning with others um if anyone has any reflections at this particular point uh Belinda I can see you've unmuted yourself so maybe you want to say something yeah um I'm just thinking about I don't know because I don't actually have an evaluation qualification or practice but mm. one of the things about COVID has been that um people who live in outside capital cities have found that we can actually participate in a lot more, at least, um, you know, free professional development um, and breakouts and conversations due to that. And I don't know, but I assume there's been some value added from mixing that up. Um, and also people of colour, prof professionals who are people of colour. Um, yeah, I guess ways of, of reaching outside the box to you know, when you've got a community of practice, it doesn't have to be all practitioners of the th same practice, um, you know, whether that's evaluation or policy development or service design or whatever. Um, so, I, yeah, just encouraging to think about ways of, of reaching out. I actually find Facebook quite good for, um, for just informally being aware of conversations that are happening in my community, which actually turn out to be about well, we think this government policy is good or bad. It, it's not said in those kind of words, but it's, oh, my God, I can't get my kid into a dentist kind of stuff. So, yeah, just putting in a plug for that diversity. Yeah, great. Thank you. Um, so I'm a stickler for making sure I finish on time. Um, so just as my sort of final, uh, I guess, um, pitch, and, yes, this is just a reused slide from yesterday, so you, some of you have already seen it. Um, but what I want to really emphasize is, you know, a shift away from this idea that uh, these experiences that we have where we make mistakes or where we fail um, are something to sort of hide away or, or tuck away. Um, uh, really, we want to be sort of moving to a, um, uh, a culture of embracing our failures and learning from them. And I think that extends then to the idea of um, sort of having forums like this where we can kind of share and disseminate some of those experiences a bit um, because, uh, hopefully for some of you, you've gotten some, something out of this, but I think even for me, just hearing some of those examples that people shared and seeing some of those things that were written um, was really beneficial for me. Um, even in something that has only just come to me now, even in the context of just reassurance that I'm not the only one that, you know, makes mistakes because sometimes I'm really time poor or, you know, 
uh, sometimes feel like, oh, it'd be great if someone else could look at this, but I don't have anyone. Like some of those experiences that are maybe a bit more universal or a bit more commonplace than we might think um, is really beneficial as well. Um, so we've got two minutes left. So if there's you know questions or thoughts that people want to share, by all means. Um, uh, if you are interested in joining, we call it joining, but um, it's quite easy. Uh, the design and evaluation SIG, there's a LinkedIn group, um, which you can search for, um, or you can send an email to the email address there. Um, and uh, we've got a, a sort of mailing list that we can add you to. If you're interested in helping to organize activities, you can also send an email and, and um, do it that way. Um, and I'd also just like to take this moment to thank um, Bill and Michelle and the AES for hosting the Learning Sprint this week. Thank you again. Um, so with the 90 odd seconds remaining, if anyone has any thoughts or questions or uh, general ideas um, that they wanna share, by all means, unmute yourself, talk freely, um, but otherwise we're sort of formally wrapped up um, with, uh, with this session.